and I'm working mostly on uh, on the microstructure of financial markets and, and, and price impact, as Matteo mentioned. Uh, so just to give an idea, what is CFM? Uh, to, 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 so, so what, what does it have to do with uh, with physics? It's a, CFM is, a, is a, an investment manager, a quantitative investment manager, uh, which we also can call a hedge fund. Uh, what it means, investment manager, it, 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 it manages money of people who invest in. So it's, it doesn't manage its own money; it's, uh, it manages uh, investors' money. And uh, and what is a hedge fund? I won't go in detail. It's 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 a question of regulation, what type of investments a company can do, and uh, hedge funds are less regulated than maybe uh, pension funds, for example. It's a, it's a detail that is not very important here, but, uh, but it's important to know that at CFM we, we have around 60-ish physicists, a couple of them uh, you might know, I mean, people who were at ICTP, for example, before. And um, and there are several different research groups. There are people working on long-term signals for on, on several months, which in the jargon of, of finance is called alpha signals. And um, and and other people among the mass working more on on executions, so, so strategies which are below, which have timescales typically below one day. So want to understand the, the dynamics of prices on, on short scales, on few seconds, few milliseconds, few minutes, few hours. And, uh, and actually, it's this group which, uh, which has most of the, the connections to, to, to academic research uh, for, for a couple of reasons that we can discuss. I don't want to go in detail here. So, so this is CFM. And one more thing which could be interesting more in general to you is that actually CFM, apart from hiring a physicist, also has clear uh, collaborations in uh, with academia. Um, so, for example, there is um, there, there are three so I mean, collaborations, of course, everywhere in research. But there are three institutes with which there is uh, explicit collaboration. One is the Imperial College in London, where it's a CFM Institute on Quantitative Finance, and uh, there are several postdocs and PhD students. Uh, uh, who work there. There is a collaboration with École Normale Supérieure in Paris, more on machine learning and, and big data related questions, also looking for PhD students often. And actually there is a new collaboration with École Polytechnique, uh, which is a chair in econophysics, um, which is really, a, that, that's the closest collaboration with, with CFM, who are, there are several interns, several PhD students and postdocs who already work there or who are, they are looking for. Actually, I think there are people here who, there is one people who should be, yes, one person who, who is related to this. Anyway, I just say this, that, that, uh, that they are looking for people. So if you're interested in some of these, or if you think that things we discuss here is stupid, so we could do it better, uh, it, it, there's a way to get in. Uh, so, as I said, different, there are several topics in finance that I'll discuss. It's not at all a traditional finance or economics course because I will get into detail a bit. So actually today it will be mostly an introduction of what are markets, what is economics, what is different uh, that we do. But traditionally, in, in traditional finance and economics, uh, people are too much relied on, on idealized principles, uh, to at least uh, to, to, to our taste. And, um, and it's not a financial math course either, which is, uh, which is a, an important part of mathematics, but we are not doing it. So in financial mathematics, there is, at least again to my taste, there is too much wishing for, uh, for mathematical beauty. And, uh, and actually there is nice mathematics in it, but I'm not sure it is related to, to, to actual finance and actual markets. And of course, I wouldn't actually, there are very good courses in financial mathematics. If one is interested in the math part, I wouldn't be the right person for that. Um, so what we will do in the, in the following, well, I will try to be data-driven in the sense that uh, we will see a lot of empirical results and, uh, and and we will start with, with data first, uh, so, so before doing models, and then we will try to describe this data in a proper way. And, uh, and maybe unlike, I mean, I don't know how the other courses here went up to now, but I have the feeling that maybe we will be a bit less uh, quantitative computational in this course. So we will do calculations, we will do math, 
but uh, but my idea is more is that we should understand get an intuition of how markets work how to start how to model them so the actual if, if one needs to really apply these ideas uh, it's important to do calculations but maybe there will be less uh, in that sense uh, as I said um, I will, so it's, uh, I will try to point out the difference between economics and econophysics in this course. So I will try, try to stop in some cases where we say, okay, that, that, that's why we are doing something different. And so, so the, the final idea is to, to, to give a new point of view of, tra of trying to understand uh, how, how prices move and why they move. So instead of traditional economics uh, approach of, of efficient markets, uh, which we'll discuss, try to understand how how price impact can lead to diffusive prices, essentially. So we'll understand what these notions are, but, but this is the goal. There will be a relatively large focus on microstructure, which I will define better, but it's again, it's because of my taste. And what I will try to do is also show some, I mean, I hopefully we have time to show some applications. So to come up with models that can describe maybe prices, but also see how can we apply these to, to if you wanted to, to optimize something uh, like trading. So, so there is no, uh, okay, there is no single book that I could give you. So there, uh, there are, I think there are two books which, which cover here and there different parts of this, uh, of, of what we discuss here. So which are not by chance are very much related to, to the people I work with. So one is, um, one is a quite recent book of, uh, Bouchot, Bonnard, uh, Donier, and Gould. What the title is Trades, uh, Trades, Quotes, and Prices. TQP, I write it. Uh, it, it, it covers a lot of things in microstructure, if so if one is interested, of course, there is much more in it than what, what we discuss here. Another cool, yeah, sorry, <laughs> so it's trades, quotes, and prices, which is a nice title because it's like everything. <laughs> um, uh, sorry, I put TQP because sometimes, I, I mean, I will show some figures. I will sometimes write where I got the figure from. TQP will send for this. But, uh, but you're right. So there is another book which, is, um, which covers much less of what, what we discuss here. And it's much harder to read, I think, which is, again, this first of there is the same. So Bouchot and Mark Potters, of which the title is uh, Theory of Financial risks and something. So um, anyway, so if, if you want to look into this, I mean, uh, I don't expect you to read it at all. So we will try to cover everything that we want to discuss here, but if you're interested. Um, and so, 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 so I want to give an outline of what we are thinking, what we are going to discuss, I mean, more, to be more concrete. So, so what, what I think we are going to, to, do, to do today is it readable or something? Risks, this. So theory of financial risk uh, and, and, and uh, maybe and derivative prices. I don't know. If, if you search for this, it will, it will be, I think, enough. Um, so, 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 so the outline of, 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 uh, of the entire course is something like, like the following. Like today we will have a... An introduction, okay. So, what we will discuss, I think it will be a bit storytelling today. So, we won't go very deep. It's, it's like, what are markets? Who are? Why do they exist? Who are there? And and a bit of of, of overview of some mathematical things that 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 that, that we will need. Then, uh, then we will have a couple of lecture on the question of prices. So, what we want to uh, what we want to look at is is statistics of uh, price moves. So 
So what we want to discuss here is, is well, facts from so looking at data, uh, stylized facts, important things to know. Uh, so this is for single products. We will try to discuss the same for co-movement of prices. There, so, so, so looking at correlations between different products, try to understand how we can get, get, get the information out of data um, and probably get a bit to discuss uh, how, how, how to construct a portfolio of several products if we know the correlation. Uh, and then we get to, to, to more, so this I think will be the first three lecture-ishes. Then we get to more uh, microstructure related questions. So one will be, uh, I don't know what title to, to give, so uh, about what is information, what is uh, liquidity in the market, and what is market efficiency. Though efficiency we'll discuss uh, already before. But so, so the idea here is, is to understand uh, how, how and why do prices move? So what, do, what causes the prices to move? Try to explain how, uh, how prices become diffusive, if they become diffusive on, on different time scales. And it will be an introduction to, to microstructure. So that's, that's where we, we start uh, discussing microstructure. Uh, we will have a quite long part because due to my taste maybe on uh, on price impact, which is essentially the, the response of the market to what, 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 what you're doing. How, does the, how do prices move due to your, uh, your actions? And we will have, so this will be several lectures about empirical results, first of all, of course, and try to model it on, on different timescales, on the micro scale and on, let's say, meso scale, so up to, up to one day. And uh, so, so this is, this is uh, several lectures, and probably this is also more than one lecture. And, uh, and, and, and at the end, if we have time, which I very much hope, is, is to get to, to combination of all these, uh, something that I call optimal execution. Where execution is not executing people. Execution means trading, let's say. So, when, when you actually have to go to the market and do the trades, how to do it optimally, given all the things that you, you've seen here, or I mean optimally in some sense. There will be an exam, I think, uh, and the idea is that, that we'll cover everything to, to, to be able to do the exam, and there is this question of tutorials that might, I mean, there might be tutorials, and one other thing, so here I have some slides only with figures, but I, so, so I was, I think I will be able to send some notes after the lecture, so maybe after each lecture, one or two days later, uh, some version of the notes uh, that I have to, to, to you people. I mean, I don't know how it works for other, uh, is, is that the usual way? So, so do, do, do people send the notes normally? Sorry? The same day. Okay, so th th that's also a possible approach. Yeah, okay. I, I, don't, I don't say that today I will send about today, but today is anyway, it's, it's a light, uh, light version, I think. But okay, so then, then I'll try to go with that. Um, so, okay, so, uh, so the question is uh, to, to start with, I mean, really, I, I think... Uh, what I've been told is that it's better since it's, it's a subject that people didn't really study to, to, to start uh, a simple thing. So the question is, okay, what, do we, what are markets and why do we need them? So traditionally, uh, a market is, uh, is, is, some, okay, is a meeting place of some type of, uh, uh, some type of people. It, it d depends a bit of, of, of what, uh, what markets we are looking at. So one can think about... Uh, about, uh, let's say, stock or bond market. Markets are, are typically places where, 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 uh, where well, this is a traditional way to say that there are, there are uh, people who have uh, some projects. They, they want to do something, but they don't have financing for this. Let's call them entrepreneur. 
So they have a project, but uh, no funding, let's say. So they need funding. Is it readable what I'm writing? Yes. No there. So okay. So I, I will project, but no finding, and I will try to be cleaner after it. So this is one type of of uh, of people, and there are investors, which are the opposite side of the uh, entrepreneur. So oh, what's a good way? It's, it's a bit of French word in English. So well, it's people who have projects that they want to realize and don't have. Uh, what's a good word for entrepreneur? I don't know. Another word. Um, so, 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 and there are investors who are the opposite side of the story, who have money to invest, but uh, and, and they want to gain on it. So, well, investors have money to invest, and uh, and these people want to meet. First of all, you you want a place where uh, these two people can uh, can meet for the for the for the good for both of them. And also often, I mean, investors, so they have money and they want to invest it, but it's not obvious on what time scale. So it's, uh, I mean, it's triviality what I'm saying, that, uh, that you might have money you want to invest. I don't know, you have 10,000 euros, you want to invest it somewhere, but maybe two years from now you want to buy a car, so you want to be able to get your money out of this investment somehow. So, 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 so you are all, you're only ready to, to to, end, to, to, to invest your money if you think that you can exit your position easily. So what you want is easiness of exiting a position. So by position, it's, it's, it's what you own, you want to be able to sell easily. Uh, and so easiness of exiting a position is, is often called liquidity in the market. Uh, and by easiness of exiting the position, of course, what we mean is easy to find someone to trade with, and easy to find someone to trade with at a price that can be acceptable to, for you. If you bought something for $100, and now another person is ready to buy it for 50 while the price didn't really go down, you won't be happy because you, so you want to get out easily at a proper price. And, uh, and to do this, so, so, so to, to, to be able to trade, so to find someone to trade with and to have liquidity, you need markets. You need to be easily, um, to easily find, um, uh, find counterparties. And what, what one would think is that without, uh, without this system, so without investors and entrepreneurs finding each other, of course, uh, the economy would be much slower. So this is the traditional explanation. I mean, economics, economy would slow down because people who have great ideas are not able to realize. So this is the traditional, traditional uh, traditional explanation. Uh, another type of, of explanation uh, between why these entrepreneurs and investors want to meet is, I, just, I will just write up the word here, uh, is, is the question of uh, risk premium. I won't go in detail, but traditionally this is a bit away of understanding all movement, uh, to, to, to explain all type of movements in the market. But it's an economist approach is a bit, is to say that, that there is a risk premium, so that if I'm ready to be on one side of a transaction, um, and I'm trying to gain it, so, so that, that there is a transfer of risk, that in this case, there is the entrepreneur who has a great idea and doesn't have the money, or maybe has the money, but doesn't want to risk losing, losing the money, the investor, is ready to take a part of this uh, part of his risk, so give the money. Say, okay, use my money to to try to realize what you realize your great idea. Well, I hope I will gain, but if not, uh, so I, I, I'm paid for for taking some of the risk from you. So this is traditionally the, the picture about stock markets. Uh, it's uh, the, the the idea that that markets are made. Up so for for people to meet is the same, but of course there are there are uh, there are products which we'll discuss a bit more in detail. But but there are more what we call derivative products, which, as we'll see, 
or the definition is that 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 the a price of which the so so the if a pri the product uh, the price of a product is derived from another product these are what we call uh, derivative products we'll have a small discussion about them in, in like 10 minutes or 5 but so these products also appear so so it's it's not uh, not, not only about this type of uh, entrepreneur investor relation but they behave as as, as insurance policies and uh, which I will explain a bit better in a second but the, but the idea here is that you want to insure yourself against some large price variations. In another way, you want to hedge yourself. So, so those people who are trading for insurance region, region, reasons are often called hedgers. Um, so this is, and, and traditionally these, these derivative products are, uh, are most important in, um, in, uh, in commodity products, so oil, orange agricultural products and, and maybe FX rates. So, so okay, so we discussed a bit, uh, so, so uh, the, the, the need for markets is, is essentially is as a meeting place for different types of traders. And we discussed a bit who are the actors. So we said, okay, that there are, uh, well, traditionally there, is, there are entrepreneurs, there are investors. We said that there are hedgers. And there is one other, type of person which we, which we can understand from here that we need them. But we said that we want liquidity. Well, we need someone to make this market liquid. So if, if there are only these people who have great ideas or they have money to invest for a long time, well, they can meet at the market. But uh, if there are not many of them, it, they, they, it will be hard to meet each other. So you, what, we, what type of extra actors you mean? So, OK, so this was a <laughs> so. Another type of uh, actor is what we call liquidity providers. Uh, who provide liquidity. Uh, who typically are, 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 there are two groups of liquidity providers. I mean, the traditional description. So there are People who explicitly their job is to provide liquidity, we call them often uh, market makers. Or who, who are who are intermediaries. Intermediaries, so their idea is exactly they don't have a signal, they don't know they, they don't want to buy or sell separately. They just want to say they just want to be on both sides of the of the, of the trade. If you want to sell, they buy from you, and they will uh, sell to someone else. So they are just act as intermediaries between uh, between people who have some greater idea of why they want to trade. And typically, we will discuss a bit in detail. They, of course, it's not just because of uh, goodness that they do it. They get some uh, uh, something in exchange, and there are what we call usually well, it's not a nice word, uh, speculators. Who, or, or we can call them uh, informed traders, so, so who have some, typically some short term information. So short term can mean different things. Of course, today it can mean a second. Uh, traditionally, it could be it was a longer time. But some, on some short term, they have an information or they think that they have an information. The price of a product will go down. They want to buy it now. Just for uh, just to get a, sell it sell it very soon, so they don't really want to invest money on long term. They don't care about what 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 this product really is. They just think that the price will go in one direction and trade to gain on this. And anecdote, so speculator is uh, well, it's not a very nice word, but uh, that's that's the case. And um, uh, and then it's a very big group of group of traders. And uh, and traditionally, it's speculators who are the most prone to to herding behavior, so to every one of them do the same, because maybe they use the same information or because they look at each other, uh, they are prone to panic. So, so the, the, the usual idea of markets, of, of markets behaving very, um, how do you call it, uh, turbul in a turbulent way, are often blamed on, 
on speculators. And uh, one, one more mention that I want to say. So this is a very traditional way, uh, way of, of looking at markets. If uh, in today's markets where, where th things are electronic, so people can, uh, uh, so anyone can, can provide liquidity, it's a bit hard to make a difference between these type of groups. So both of them provide liquidity. They are there to trade uh, quite often. You don't know why they do. So of, traditionally, market makers were designated. They, were, they had a sign on them that they are market makers. Today, you don't really know. So it's hard to, to make a difference. So, so well, this is uh, what are markets and why we have them. I wanted to give a, stock, uh, a short discussion of, of what the, yeah, sorry, of, of what the different uh, products that, that are traded and that we will discuss what they are. It's... Uh, well, it's partly for general culture. Of course, I mean, uh, one wants to know what, uh, when we are discussing uh, in the following, when we will discuss uh, data, you want to know what, what the, these products are, but, but it's, uh, it's also for general culture that we want to look at this. So we'll most often look at, uh, at, uh, at stocks. So uh, stocks, or, or you can call them I mean, shares. I think this is probably known by everyone, but it's, it's, it's an ownership in a company. A, a fractional ownership, of course. And, um, and there are public companies of which anyone can get uh, stocks or get a partial ownership. I don't know if you go to the stock market, you can buy stocks of Apple easily. These are public companies and there are private companies. Mm -hmm. Sorry, private stocks. Um, that the, of which uh, uh, stocks can be bought only directly from the owner, so not from not on, on on the stock market. We will, of course, mostly think about public companies in the following. There are so I mean, having an ownership of a company means that you you really own it, so you have rights to vote in the uh, in the decisions, and different stocks can go with different own, voting rights. Uh, we don't care about these details, I think. One important thing for general culture, of course, is that if a company makes, uh, I mean, uh, makes profit, then this profit can either be reinvested in the company or can be paid out to the owners of the shares as a dividend. Uh, this is important for general culture, and it's also important that, of course, these cause predictable changes in the price. If you know that the fact of owning a stock on a given day will give you the right to a dividend that, of course, has some mechanical effects on 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 the on the price of this uh, of the price of this stock. One important thing that often we do not think about is that in case of stocks, well, in other cases as well, but in this case of stock, there there are several things that can happen to a company. A company can go bankrupt, and company can be taken over by another one. So there are several changes that can, especially when we are studying data, can 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 give bias. So. If you have, a, if you only study stocks that were available in your data set from 1995 to 2005, on the first day, on the last day, they were both there. It's a huge bias in your studies because you don't take into account all of them that went bankrupt in this period. So it's it's just uh, to to be careful. Uh, we also often discuss stock indices. which is essentially a, a stock index is, is a basket of, of stocks. So, 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 so the price of a stock index is some type of average of the prices of the stocks in this basket. Uh, it, can be, uh, it can be some different, so I mean, uh, of course, it can be a flat average. It can be weighted by... The, the size of the company in some in some in, in some definition, and um, and it can be defined for different categories. So a sector, a given sector, can have an index, or a ge geographical zone can have an index. It's not very important, and especially in case of stock indices, what I discussed here, uh, it's important this type of selection bias and uh, survival bias. Of course, a stock index can change its constituents, so the basket can change in time. So you have to be careful when, uh, when, do, the, when do a study. Uh, what I discussed here is, uh, I mentioned already, these derivative products. So, so, uh, so, so, so futures contracts 
or well, futures or forward contracts. A third group that we will often discuss, which is a derivative product, I said this is price is derived from another. So a futures is uh, uh, this type of contract. The idea is that you buy or sell an asset today to be delivered sometime in the future. So you pay the price that is defined today and you will get uh, uh, in the future. So, so buy, sell today and get delivered in the future. So the idea here is exactly, that's why I said that these are insurance products. You can buy a futures contract today uh, for, uh, let's say you, you, you know that you will need uh, crude oil in the summer, but you're afraid that the price of it will go up until then. So you can Get a, buy a futures contract now to get the to 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 be delivered in the summer. So you pay the price now, you will get the crude oil in the summer. So you're insured against the price going up like crazy. You don't if if today the price is 100 in the summer it would be 150. You will be very happy that you bought the futures contract uh, today. Of course, if the price went down, bad things can happen. Then then you pay then 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 you lost on the on the on the on the deal. So, but but it, it's it, you you hedge yourself, you insure yourself against uh, large price changes. Yeah. Do these future contracts exist for any market? They exist, no. So not for any market. They they, well, they they exist for. I mean, many, not for every product. For many products, but they are most liquid on. Uh, so on on indices, they are very liquid on agri agriculture and commodity products. I said, because there it's really. If you produce something, it's, it's, it can be important for uh, foreign exchange products, so, so, so USD GBP rate or something like this. Um, in many markets, they exist. Uh, if I change my mind, uh, can I sell the future to someone else? Or? Sure. Okay, so sure. Uh, so, so what we discuss here are all traded on, on existing markets. So if you find someone to sell it to, no problem of selling it. So, okay, actually, I want to say one more. Actually, the difference, I wrote futures and forward, which is the same idea. The difference is that forward is uh, what we call over-the-counter product. So you buy it from someone, I buy it from you. Um, so you will have to deliver. I mean, uh, if I buy, you, you are delivering me later. It's, it's a one-to-one -one match. You have to convince. If, if you want to get out of the, the deal, you have to convince me that I'm okay to trade with him. So it's, it's, it's not a centralized market. But futures, the futures version of the contract is traded on a market on which you buy from somewhere. You don't even see the person. It's, it's, uh, it's an invisible person to you, there is a market in between you. So sorry, to answer the question, yes, you can get out of, of, of the deal, of course, but what it means that you have to convince someone. So if you bought a, to, to get crude oil in the summer, you bought it for 100, and now you see that the order, already the, sorry, and you want, and the price went down, now it's 80. So you say, oh, I want to get out because I could do better. You still have to convince someone to buy this from you. So if it has no value anymore because uh, it is very, the price is very far from what, current price from what you paid, uh, it will be hard to convince someone to, to, to get it from you. I don't know if it's clear what I'm. Yeah. Um, so, so, so these are futures contracts and uh, another type of product I want to discuss are our options, which, uh, which, uh, which are also derivative products, uh, but they are a bit more complicated uh, than futures. I want to spend a minute on these. So, so, so what, what, what we said here, so futures is uh, buy now to get delivered uh, later in the future, but it's, it's, it's a contract. Uh, so I mean, it's, 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 uh, if the price went in the wrong direction, uh, you will be sad. There are options which are, again, they are derivative products, uh, of which, well, we see from the names, there is an optionality, which means that it is, the, it is the right, but not the obligation to buy something in the future at a later date for the price that you decided today. So it's, it's while, while this future is our obligation, this is a, a right, but not obligation 
to, uh, to, 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 to buy something at a later date for the price that you decided today. So in that sense, it's, it's like a futures contract. Uh, yeah. Yes, yeah, okay, so, so what the, the word derivative simply comes that the price of this depends on the price, and so it's derived from the price of something else. So what this happens, so okay, let's, let's give an example here. You could say that um, you buy a, an option on, let's, let's say on a stock, so for simplicity, on Apple stock, you buy an option that, that will have a, that has a, Okay, sorry, no, I, I will do another way. I will draw up something and I think that will, that will clarify the question. So just to say one word before. So there are, uh, so this is right but not obligation to, to buy, sell uh, at a later expiry and get delivered at a later expiry date. There are two types of options that, uh, there are call options and put options. It's simply a, a jargon, so call, is to buy the product and put is to sell. And, um, and, um, and so I will draw up the, the, what, what they call the payoff function of, of an option and I think that will, that will explain uh, the question. So the payoff function essentially what, what one looks at uh, in a case, let's say, uh, if you buy a call option, You can write up the, the profit that you're going to make as a function of uh, as, as, a, as a function of the price of the product at expiry of the sorry of the underlying product at expiry. So okay, so because so this derivative product, you, you buy the option to get delivered something later, and this uh, this something is the underlying. This is, it is called the underlying. So what we, uh, what we want to plot here is the profit as a, uh, as a function of the price of the, well, the underlying uh, at expiry. So if you bought a call option, there is a, you, you pay the price for it, which is, uh, not sorry, not, you, 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 there is a strike price in, the, in this option. So, so the price at which you will get this, uh, you will be able to, to exercise this option at expiry. This is called strike price. So what, what does this option uh, worth? If the price at expiry is below the well, strike price is here, so the strike is here. If the price of, of the option at expiry is below this, uh, below this price, means that you have the option to buy Apple for 100 euros in a month and then you arrive to that moment in a month and Apple is worth 80. Okay, you, that, it, then it is not worth anything. You won't exercise this option. You will throw it out in the bin. So you have, you made no profit if the, stri if the, if the price at the expiry is below the strike price. While if it's above in the same way, you start gaining. If you have the right to buy it for 100 and the current price is 105, you gained five uh, euros. So if the price at expiry is above the strike price, you simply gain the difference between the price and the strike price. So from this we already see that, so the price of this product and the profit on this option product depends on the price of the underlying at the expiry. So this is why we call it derivative, so it's derived from the price of the underlying. And, um, and in practice, so, so this, this, this is the ideal picture of, of uh, actually I have a figure about this. So you have a, this is the ideal picture of, uh, of your profit, but in practice, of course, when you got the option, you had to pay out something. They, you didn't get it for free, so you had to pay something which is called a premium, and that has to be subtracted from this curve. So it will be somehow like this, the actual, I don't know if you have colors. So your actual profit will be something like this. If the option is useless at the end, you lost what you paid when you got this option. And if you start gaining on this still, you have to stop track this premium that you paid. So this is what we see. This is what we see here. So long call. Uh, okay, so this is a jargon in finance that <coughs> being long means buying, being short means selling. It's a one-to-one -one map between 
So buying a call and long call is the same. Um, so this is, these are options market. We don't go, actually, we won't discuss them in details in the later, in later, uh, later. Uh, but I think it's, it's important to know. We will mention them sometimes. Uh, of course, I mean, here we have, for put options, you have the situation, and for selling a call option, you have it. I mean, it, it's a, once one understands one of these curves, it's, the, the, the others are, are, are very simple. Why? I mean, suppose you buy some product for 100 and then at expiry, I mean, if, if you have to sell it at 80, then okay, you have a loss of 20, but you still... You ah, if you also bought the product. So what I'm talking about here is that you buy the right to get Apple uh, stocks for 100 in uh, end of March. If you arrive end of March and the the, the price of Apple is 80, then this is useless for you. What you're saying, if I understand well, that at the same time, if you have stocks of Apple in your pocket, or at, if at the same time you know you, you have to buy, uh, no, sorry, that, so if you have Apple stocks in your pocket, so you have something else as well, not just this option, that can change the entire payoff. But only have the, having these options in your pocket, if the price now in the market is 80, and I have the right to buy it for 100, that doesn't help me. I will. I can go and buy it for 80, but that has nothing to do with this option. Did I, did I answer or not? Okay, so but don't, don't forget it then. Um, so, so, so these will be a couple of type of products that we will discuss in the future, and we discussed a bit what, why, why these markets exist. So I wanted to go a bit into discussing what is econophysics versus economics. Which, uh, which, which I mentioned several times. So the crucial difference is, uh, the crucial difference in, uh, between, uh, between economics and, and econophysics is the role of concepts, the role of equations, and the role of data. And, uh, Is there a question? Okay. Um, so, so the crucial difference between econophysics and economics is the is is, is the role of these things, three things: so concepts, equations, and data. It seems to be very different, very similar. So, economics versus econophysics, and and. What, 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 what is the main thing is that in classical economics there are very, very strong assumptions or sort of axioms, if, if, you, if you think about mathematics, uh, that, are, uh, that are assumed uh, and might not be true. Uh, so in classical economics typically you have three big, I mean I will just mention these uh, three big axioms. One is which is called rationality. One is, uh, which is called, often, which is called invisible hand. And one uh, which we will discuss more in detail is, is efficiency. Uh, so in any case, uh, uh, just to, 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 to make sure, I mean, I'm explaining this here to, to, to make clear what the difference is. I don't expect you to learn the invisible hand, definitions of invisible hand. I mean, it's more just to get a, an understanding of it. Uh, it's, it's not a uh, type of question you'll ask. So re what is rationality? Well, it's easy to, to understand the word, but typically, I actually, I looked at Wikipedia what, how they define the rational agent. And it says, an agent that has clear preferences, models uncertainty via, via expected values of variables or functions of variables, and always chooses to perform the action with the optimal expected outcome from among all feasible possibilities. So uh, what, what one immediately feels from this is that it's, it's something very, very idealized. You, yeah, sure, you try to, you might have clear preferences. 
you try to model uncertainty in some way, but that, that becomes very hard. But especially this idea of choose uh, to perform the best actions among all of them. Well, I think we know that it's never the case. You, you're never doing this. You, you, at most, you look at a subset of, of, uh, of, uh, of the possibilities. So this is the definition of rational agents. This is the way economics looks at, 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 at actors in the market. And, uh, and the way, uh, if everyone is rational in the, in somehow in the same way, having the same type of information, then actually what economics says is that you can, instead of having all these ac agents, you can just model one representative agent. Because they are all the same. They have the same information. They are optimizing the same things. Why do you have to, if there is no difference between them, you can simplify modeling. Well. I guess it's clear that, that this is uh, quite far from reality. Another thing which is invisible hand, which is from, uh, I have a quotation from Paul Samuels, a very important uh, economist, who says that each individual in pursuing his own interest, uh, or his own selfish good, is led as by an invisible hand, so that's why it's called invisible hand, is led, by, uh, is led to achieve the best good for, uh, for all of society, essentially, this is what it says. So what it says that we are all trying to optimize something for ourselves, and this will bring to a, to a global optimum for society. Uh, and any interference, this is a sad edit to it, any interference into free competition was, uh, is almost certainly injurious, it's bad for, for society. So, okay, this, this is what's invisible hand. And efficiency, which I think is more interesting, is, um, says that prices reflect all information, public or private, and, and no one can earn excess returns. So, so prices have all information in them. You cannot just go to the market. You cannot have extra information to earn money. So we know that this is not true. There are people at least who try to earn money and for long periods can earn money. But somehow we have the feeling that so there are these three axioms of, of economics. A part of, uh, about some things you have the feeling that it's not true. Uh, from a part you might not have the feeling it's not true or not, but maybe it's something that it's hard to prove or disprove. So uh, somehow you have the feeling actually from these three that it's a bit of a political propaganda-like uh, thing. So that markets will go to the, uh, to the optimum of society, we bring the society to its optimum. And, uh, and, uh, and mark and, and find the perfect prices. Uh, so, so there are these type of uh, axioms in, in economics, but the main, most important thing is that in economics, axioms are stronger than observations. So these are said, and uh, there are several papers of economics, economists one can look at who say that, okay, so these, these are stronger than, than facts. These are the truth of the world, and if, if, if data seems to show something sim different, then uh, that's the problem of the data. So that's why physicists arrived, who think that observations matter. Um, and usually physicists say that if, if, if a model is not compatible with the data, then, well, you try to throw away the model, not the data. Uh, and instead, if, in economics, if, if uh, data and models do not match, then they call it an anomaly that they don't try to model. So it's a, this is the type of, um, uh, type of problem. And just a remark that uh, what, what one could say is that there are a lot of physicists working in banks since the 80s. So since the end of the Cold War, there are many, many physicists who went into banking. It seems that they, they forgot very quickly their, their physics, physics approach to, to look at data before looking at axioms. Uh, and apart from not being true, of course, this type of oversimplified view of the world is, is super dangerous. For, for example, if you want to estimate a distribution, so as we have said here, in rational agents are very good to estimate uh, expected values, but to estimate a distribution is very tough, so from real data. Uh, and that is, of course, related to the probability of, 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 a, of a crash in the market. And estimating, for example, joint probability, so the, of several random variables, the joint probability is even harder. Course, and then and, and that's uh, if we don't uh, estimate them well, that's when we get an entire uh, simultaneous default of several products. And, uh, and just to give some, some, some examples of this, so uh, if we have time, okay, we'll see examples I think in the later, uh, later on. I won't go into detail now. Uh, so there are new approaches to, to this. So, so this is the traditional approach in, in, in economics. There are new approaches, one from inside. Uh, 
uh, economics, which is called behavior of finance, which understands that people are not so rational or not rational in the same way, uh, and econophysics on the other side. And I just wanted to put a, a quotation from Carl Solms, who is a super, uh, very famous economist, and he seems to be very much more uh, optimistic than me, so this is from 2002. But so what he says that, what he hoped is that in the past two decades, so this was almost 20 years ago, economics has witnessed an important paradigmatic change, paradigmatic change with at least three closely related aspects. So from representative agent going to heterogeneous, heterogeneous agent systems. So from this get understanding that people are not the same, from a full rationality to go to some bounded rationality that there are uh, limits to, to, to how rational you can be or how much information you can, you can get. And getting from something which is mainly analytical, which is, sorry, I didn't mention this, but this is a big problem, well, in the idea that uh, economics is axiomatic, that, uh, that economists want to have models that can be treated analytically. Economists want to be mathematicians. And if you look at an economics paper, you have theorems in it. And so they have models that are analytically tractable, and instead uh, the, the, the idea is to get to more computational approach. Of course, if you can solve something analytically, great, but it's often not the case. And similarly in finance, uh, he claimed a similar shift seems to occur. So, so, so from a complete rationality getting to, to bounded rationality and, and, and understanding that, that prices can be driven by, by, by something else than, than this rationality by the psychology of the, the actors uh, in the market. So, 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 so yes, this is, uh, this is a bit the, the difference between, I mean, in a very quick view, yeah? But I don't think it's useful, but it's used, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it remains a dog. So, so I have the feeling that there are several, okay, I, I might not be the right person to discuss it because of course I'm on one side of this picture, but, but that there are two communities, so traditional economics, uh, there is behavioral finance and econophysics, which is a much smaller, I mean, I'm discussing this here and I will discuss more, but that's, real economists do not consider uh, uh, behavioral finance, and then there is game theory, some uh, theory in between, but uh, but there is not that much uh, discussion between. So it's, uh, I, I think everything uh, falsifies the invisible hand, but uh, but that doesn't mean it's it's not considered in similar way. So so just one last thing that I wanted to. There can be some risk. So, so uh, I'm not sure I understand. The I mean, there is a probability that, you, that there will be some lo loss associated with a purchase when, yeah. when there is a bounded rationality. And when, there is a, I mean, when the person is fully rational, then I mean, he knows all the consequences. Of course, he won't go for a deal which has some loss associated with it. Well, OK. It's, I mean, bounded rationality doesn't mean that you know the future. You know the distribution of the probabilities. You see, you buy something, okay. and you are perfectly able to, to estimate the probability of having a loss more than 10%. Okay. Of course, the problem is this, is that if you look at uh, how people behave, it, they are very bad at estimating probabilities. I mean, you, it's easy to estimate the probability of one half, but it's very easy, very different to make a difference between, very difficult to make a difference between probability of 10 to the minus 3 or 10 to the minus 8. Uh, so so it's, 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 it's more uh, bounded rationality in this sense means that you understand that you cannot, well, one example for this, I mean, it can be in several ways, but you understand that you cannot estimate a probability. Okay. So you say that, okay, the, the maximum amount that you buy is limited by the fact that you say that I cannot estimate, I cannot say that it's zero probability to lose everything of it, so I want to uh, buy something of, that even if I lose it, I can, I can live afterwards. I mean, this is a super simple example, and bounded rationality can be defined in several ways. Rationality. Like for a bounded rationality, I mean, the variance grows somehow, so you cannot, 
of this probability distribution? Why does it grow for the bounded rational? I mean, the, the probability distribution is there. Yes. Just you're not able to estimate it in this example. Yeah, exactly. So one example can be that you you understand that the variance that you measured might not be the good measure, might not exist on your data. You can always measure variance, but maybe be, maybe the real distribution does not have finite variance. It can be the case. Uh, so so I wanted to a bit related to this uh, just before we get to to to, to a bit more uh, concrete concrete things, I just wanted to give, uh, put up this, this uh, quotation, which is from uh, just after the crisis from 2009, Emmanuel Derman and Paul Wilmot, both of them background in physics and mathematics, uh, but working in finance, who, who wrote this financial models manifesto, which is a bit uh, paraphrasing the communist manifesto. And at the end, there is this modeling learns Hippocratic Oath, which is, I think, I mean, one can think about this also uh, after having done a course, but it's, I think it's, it's good to look at it. So, which the idea is, of course, it's against all this, this, this uh, e e approach of uh, traditional finance. So I remember that I didn't make the world and it doesn't satisfy my equations. And I don't think I have to explain this. Though I will do use models, boldly to estimate values, I won't be overly impressed by mathematics. So it's, uh, it's not that, that's not the goal. I will never sacrifice reality for elegance without at least explaining why I have done so. So it can be the case that you want to sacrifice, but... Uh, but you want to, be, want to be clear. I think this is very, very important. So I, I won't give people who use my model this false comfort of, of its accuracy, and instead I will try to make explicit assumptions and oversight. So of course, you're doing models. You are not, uh, you are not able to describe everything. But the main danger of, of traditional economics models is that, that it's often hidden under the rug, uh, the, the, the assumptions. And of course, uh, that's the last point. It's, it's just in general. Well, you understand that uh, that your work may have enormous effects on society. So it's, uh, it, these are important things to to understand uh, in the model, uh, and many of them beyond our comprehension. So why do we? This, this is the, the difference a bit about economics and econophysics, and we can get to to, to more uh, concrete uh, uh, points uh, in a second. Why do we want to understand markets? Well. Because you could say it's, it's not, not, uh, not the main. Why is it interesting? Well, okay. Well, I think it's an intellectual challenge. So, so somehow, if you come from physics, you understand that a market is uh, somehow a strongly interacting system with feedbacks, with bi behavioral biases uh, of, 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 of agents. Uh, and of course, for practical reasons, if you want to trade, of course, you want to limit your risk. You want to protect yourself and have a better understanding. But one other very important thing, and why our work and some of this I will discuss is important, is for regulation. That, of course, the stability of markets is important for also for those who do not trade in the market ex uh, explicitly. I mean, if there is a crisis, it, it, it has an effect of all of us. So to have proper regulation that understands the, the dynamics uh, is, uh, is very important. So, so okay, so this was uh, sort of the, the introduction um, to this, and I wanted to a bit discuss what uh, so what type of data we'll be we'll be looking at so we will be discussing time series as I mean, often you have seen them so in most of this uh, most of the lectures it will be time series that are most prob probably one dimensional so like prices of course this is the the, the big example or it could be any other time series. I mean, anyone can come up with a time series example, the position of a random walker we will discuss often, or the temperature in uh, Grignano, or something like in time. And we will have uh, two assumptions very often, which are usually not true. Uh, so we have to keep in mind and sometimes handle the data to make it true or to consider. So one is, one is uh, stationarity that we will have. Which is, I mean, I, I guess you know what it is. I mean, there are, we discuss very simple things now. But is, uh, is the fact that the, the change, so the change on a time scale uh, tau of a process, uh, which so this I will simply define as x of 
plus tau minus x of t uh, is independent of t. Uh, independent of t. So it's some type of time translation invariance that, uh, that you consider about data. It's often not true. So, I mean, one has to be careful. The data is often not stationary. And the other thing which is related to this is what you often assume is that there are no overall trends. Uh, which is uh, essentially related to this. So what you say is that the, the expectation of this over time is zero. Uh, it's uh, often not the case, actually, very trivial. If one looks at prices uh, in the last 50 years in, I don't know, the stock market, prices are typically going up on average. So often, to, to handle this, well, it depends on, on what, what is interested in, but often what you care about is the fluctuations of the process around some, some type of trend. So you, you might want to detrend the data If the trend is there overall, you might want to do some detrending to be able to look at the fluctuations of, of, uh, uh, of, the, of the movements around the, around the mean. You can all, might also want to do a detrending that depends on, uh, on the period, if there are periods when the trend is upwards, periods when it's downward. So one has to be careful not to falsify the data, but, uh, but these two assumptions can, can help uh, in, in a lot of analysis, and then you can massage the data a bit to, to make them uh, true without without uh, destroying information. So, does this take the on tau? Sorry? Uh, taking the does it depend on tau? I mean, tau has to be larger or something. Uh, no, there is no explicit dependence on tau, tau here, so you can. Right. We are talk talking about the average here. So even if they are far away, what, what, what you want, I mean, it might not be true for data, and then you want to handle it. What you want is that there is no clear trend in it. So it's not that on average, I mean, for, for any toe, you don't want this to be, to be different from zero. And if it's different from zero, you might want to do some detrending, or maybe that's the information for you. I mean, it, it depends if you're interested in the fluctuation or the trend itself. But mostly we will assume these. In next, yeah. And it's, it's, a, it's a time average, so it's, 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 it's on, on one long data set. Mm -hmm. I mean, in this sense, on a, okay. on the, in data, you're averaging in time. If this question of ensemble average against time average is a bit difficult. I mean, it could be the case that you have several different products and, uh, and you want to, we have, which have somehow the same dynamics and then you can think about an ensemble average here. Uh, so, so, but, but it's, it's, it's a timer. Uh, so, but still, very often we are. Uh, yeah. Uh, I was wondering that uh, the second equation you both means that there isn't any correlation in the system. Yeah. No. No. It no, it's not uh, correlation. So, I mean, it, this is a. No, this it, there isn't any correlation in the system. There no. No, but it, it doesn't mean that there isn't any correlation in the so system. It so just that mean means that the fluctuations, you know, completely are independent of the... Yeah. On average, the change in a given window now and later so doesn't so depend so on time. Does make sense? May you explain it in more details? Uh, yes. So what I mean here is... Uh, but I mean, the, the difference between two. So you can, you can have a, a walk which does... I mean, so, some, some process which does uh, uh, this. I don't know, something going down. So, of course, you have local fluctuations in it. But overall, you have a trend. So, if you set, I mean, this is, I don't know, if this length is, I don't know, 50, setting tau equal to 50, 
uh, you're averaging all the different uh, things. You have fluctuations, but in general, it's, it's an upward trending data, right? The, this, this difference, so, the, so this is x of t. So you look at the difference between here and, I don't know, here. It's upwards. Of course, there are examples where the difference between here and here is downwards, but on average, there is a trend above the fluctuations. I mean, it's a sum of fluctuations and trends. While you can have a process which uh, something similar, but like this. I mean, you can take off. You, you can try to fit the trend in it. You can try to say, OK, somehow it's this. You can have some statistical method. Take it off. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm, maybe I'm not explaining what you are asking. But here we are, xt, so we are discussing in general. So xt can be anything here. It's, it's a stochastic process. It's a, it's a, yes. I think that by confidently, assumption means that we are making the question really simple. We are making the? We are making the question really simple. No, means that it's far from reality, isn't it? This is far from reality. It in, indeed, it can happen that, I mean, it, it doesn't make the question simple, the fact that it, there is no trend in it. Because typically the trend is, uh, is not the, uh, the fluctuations are more, more hard to understand than the trend for me. Uh, and in general, I think. Indeed, it can be not true. I mean, in general, that's why I said this. So, so I, of course, I write X here, but X can be a price. And prices on long times might be going up. The economy is growing, and on average, prices are going up. So but indeed, it can. Yes. So that you are considering the fluctuations really small. But not really small, but if you look at actual prices from 1950s to, to Yes. So but you said that fluctuations are not so small in reality. Fluctuations are not small in reality, but especially it's the fluctuations that you're interested in. Of course, if, if you are able to, to measure this, I mean, it depends on what amount of data you have because fluctuations you're averaging out and the trend you're not averaging out. So the ratio of, of trend versus fluctuations comes into the picture as the, as the length of the data. If you have uh, 10,000 uh, 10, years of data, of course, you're able to measure easier, even if it's a small trend in it, it's easier to, to find it. Let's continue and maybe we can, we, we can discuss it or um, so, but in general still you, you, you often, you want to, you care about the, uh, about how the signal, I lost my, normally what you care is how the signal changes on, on some time scale. But if you have detrended data, of course, then this type of measure doesn't help you. So typically what one, one wants to look at is somehow uh, the measure of the standard deviation. So, um, so often what, what you care about is more the standard deviation of data, so which is uh, the square root of the variance. Where the, so the variance, which is, which is simply defined as the, as, the, as the expectation of the square of this stuff. So this is what you what you call actually variogram, we will discuss on this sometimes. So the variogram, which is the, 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 the dependence of this quantity on, on, on the time scale tau. So th this we will use quite often, we will look at it. So just to give examples of, of, uh, of this, uh, so this is a V. I don't know if it's clear. Uh, some examples of, uh, of how the variogram looks like. So one can look, of course, if you have uh, the, the xi point ri id. It's, uh, there is no, 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 uh, they are independent. Then, uh, then, then you can measure v tau, which is uh, independent of tau. Uh, which is a trivial and not really interesting case. But you can look at, of course, the, a, a Brownian motion. In which case, 
well, I, I won't write this up, show this, but I think you looked at it, yes. Standard. No, sorry, I didn't get what was that. This is V. Okay, sorry. I, I, I don't know if. It, uh, it's so it's this. But actually, I mean, uh, it's the second line, which is which is interesting. So it's, it's just one can think about the standard deviation or the variance. So one is the square root of the. Okay, sorry. I, so it was uh, it wasn't visible. You, okay. Uh, so so in case of a Brownian motion, which I think I you looked at it in the other courses, is uh, Vito is 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 linearly growing uh, growing with with the time scale with some uh, uh, with some diffusion. Uh, Diffusion constant, so this is what we call normal diffusion, and one can think about uh, anomalous diffusion point, which is a generalization. This is visible from here. Now it's visible. Okay, so anomalous diffusion, which uh, which is a generalization, so where you can say that the, 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 the this variogram uh, grows as tau to some two h exponent, where h is what is we call it Hurst exponent. I think we, you discussed about this in other courses these days, no? So usually so this is the general point of how how the variance um, scales. This is called the Hurst exponent. And in general, one can write up uh, that uh, one, one, one can try to plot the variance as a function of time scale. Well, you can have something which is linear. This is, uh, this is the normal diffusion, so which is h equal to 1 half. So this would be a, this is an exponent 1. You can have h below 1 half, which is, uh, which is uh, a mere reverting process. That's why, you, or, or subdiffusive. Let's call it subdiffusive. But in in the next in finance, it's more like me reverting that one one uses. And in the other case, of course, it could be above zero five, which is super diffusive. So this is this is a measure that we'll often uh, that we'll often look at. And just to get an example. One further example. What do I find? Uh, is one can can think about one type of mean reversion process, which is uh, actually often seen in uh, in uh, case of stochastic processes, where you say that your process behaves like this. K plus one is something like this. Trying to write properly, but I'm not able. Uh, yes, so so you can define a process like this, where this eta is some normally distributed, so uh, with some uh, uh, n sigma squared. So this is, these are Gaussian distributed steps. Um, and um, and of course, okay. So just to start, so this is type of some type of mean reverting process. You see that that there, there is a spring that tries to to, to bring the the, uh, the process back to back to the origin. So if you set uh, omega equals zero, then this is a simple random walk without uh, without mean reversion. Then this is just one, and then it's easy. So it's just the, the position at x plus one is the position x. K plus uh, plus the step, the Gaussian step, and if one wants to write up the 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 variance of this process, so first of all, okay, you can write up 
the same, it's just rewriting this, you can write up So one can write up essentially from this process, just write up essentially a geometric, uh, a geometric series for the for the position at, at time k uh, of, of this walker, and uh, which uh, okay, we, I won't go very much in, in detail here, but uh, but this is quite quite easy. One can quite easily write up. So this is a mere reverting process. If you look at k going to infinity, so for long times. So that, that the initial, uh, so, so that the process is, is stationary, you you can write up the the, the variogram of this process, essentially writing up a, a sum of of, uh, of of a geometric series and taking the square, you you get something like this. I think, so this is what you say. Look, get for so this quantity for the for the variogram as a function of time scale, which means that if one wants to plot this, what does it mean? For, uh, for short times, you can, you can do some series expansion and it, it, you will get a linear term with a, with a certain slope. So if you plot Vito uh, as a function of the time scale, what you get is you get some linear, decrease, linear increase in the beginning and for large times, of course, this guy will disappear. So large though this guy will disappear, you're, go you, you're going to a constant. So, which is sigma square over omega. So for large times, you are somehow going here. Well, in between, one can calculate. We don't do it now. So, for example, this is a, an interesting, interesting process because what you see is that for long times, you saturate at this point. The, the the variance uh, saturates, while for short times you have uh, you have some normal diffusion. You don't feel the, the strength of the of the spring. Uh, so this is normal diffusion. Why I wrote up uh, this uh, the, this toy uh, this toy here? It's it's a well-known model in, in stochastic processes it's called uh, Ornstein Ulenbeck. Back process and it's it can be used uh, in physics. It's in, in, in some, some big particles in a vicious system. It's used in finance for interesting models. We won't really use it, but it's. Uh, I wanted to show it. Uh, I mean, it will come up, but I wanted to show it an example of, of calculating the, 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 the variogram for a mere reverting process. Um, one uh, very related thing that we'll often look at is, uh, is what we call signature plot, which is essentially the same as is the variogram divided by the, by the time scale on which it has been calculated. So it's, it's, it doesn't add more information, but visually it can, uh, it can uh, help us understanding how the data looks like. So this, for some reason, don't ask me why, it's called signature plot. So, so which is um, which is which is what what we shown before. So it's uh, the, the variogram at time scale tau divided by tau. This is what we usually uh, as a function of tau. This is what we call a signature plot. I will I will show you it in a second. Um, and I will show. I will. I just want to do a quick calculation about uh, how. The signature plot should look like for some some very idealized uh, price process. So let's assume that you have uh, you have a price which is uh, which is uh, the following. So the price at time t is some well, some reference time at time price at time zero plus all the price changes since then. Uh, it's good from zero to t minus one. So all the, it's a trivial thing. Price now is the price before plus all the price changes seen. And just for simplicity, I will write it like this. So the scale of this is put in p hat. It's some typical scale of the price. It's a constant here. Uh, let's forget it. It's not moving very far. 
and uh, and then that that way we, it's so this is of of, of uh, the order of magnitude of R doesn't contain P anymore. We took it out. So what you think for you can say that the, the F you hope that that this guy here has uh, zero mean and some uh, some uh, some some variance. This is an R here. And um, and let's further assume that there is some correlation between the steps here, which might not be a very financial approximation, but for this model we can say that, that the, the, the correlation, okay, so we are here doing a problem because I will discuss a bit about correlation exactly on that slide, I mean on the other side of the board in one minute, but you know what a correlation is, so we can use it before uh, defining it. So, so let's say that the correlation simply is uh, define it like this, uh, our correlation. So of course, for example, if this was a simple random walk, so there is no correlation, then, then, then one, one could say that, that CR of tau is, is, is chronicle delta of zero, of zero and tau. Um, so if you want to write up this, the, the, this measure that we had here, so, so this uh, what we call signature plot, uh, you need to define the variogram first. So, so in this process, of course, one can write up the variogram. So, what is it? It's 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 this this expectation, and um, and uh, well, one one can write this out properly. So this would be, of course. Uh, which is, I mean, I'm just writing out uh, the, the, the definition, which can be, of course, written up uh, as, a, as the following double sum. It can be written somehow like this. So what I'm doing here is, is, is super simple. I'm getting this definition, and this definition for the variogram, I'm putting it together. So 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 the variance at uh, time scale tau will be this, the, the square of this, and which you can write up as as, uh, as two sums on t and t prime, or t prime and t double prime, and uh, and put the expectation inside. And the, the, the sum of expectations is the. What's the letter? It's an R. Sorry. Yeah, I, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so it's uh, what, what we, so what we say here that you have a price process P. So the price at time T, it, it, it's, it's a very simple model. Price at time T is some initial price at time zero plus all the price changes since then. Simply you say, I add up all the price changes in each non-overlapping window. I will get the price today. So those are R, which is, uh, which is the steps of this process. And for simplicity, I take this P hat out. Essentially, I take the scale of it out. So one could define this instead of, of, uh, of having an R tilde here without the pi, without the, 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 the P hat. And I just take a scale. So this is a constant number that I put in front. Yes, R, so R is, is, is the steps of this process. I mean, this is the definition of the process. I can define a process like this, and then I can give an interpretation that this is a price and these are returns, that's why it's R. But, but this is in itself a definition of process. But it can be, if you think about the price, it's uh, the change of a price in a big window is the sum of the changes in small windows. No, I mean P. I oh, know P T, and of course I'm uh, I'm averaging over time. But you subtract from P T plus tau P T. Yes. P T. So it's exactly what what we had uh, in, uh, in, on, on a blackboard that I that I cancelled. So you're looking at the 
change of this signal on a time in a time window tau. Look at the square of this because you think that, uh, that there is no overall trend, so it's the second moment that can be interesting for you, and then you take the average of this. Is it uh, okay? Um, so, 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 to get on, so one can write up this uh, this sum here. If I write here below, it's completely non-visible, right? Then I will write there. Um, So of course this sum that we have here is, is well, these are the definitions of correlations, essentially. So of course one can write up, so, so continuing this, this will be something like, so you have a sigma r square because of the definition of correlation this way, um, and, uh, and you, sorry, there, I made an error here. So of course this is p hat, these are squared here. So you will have something like this, okay, so the, this is trivial, and you have different terms of the correlation that you're summing here. You're summing on the two, on two variables, so well, I can write it out, but it, I mean, I could, it could be homework. So you have two cases when the lag between t prime and t double prime is zero, so two times c at lag zero, plus uh, one can count the different terms uh, pam, 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 one can write these up, I, I won't finish them, but it's, uh, it's, it's easy to write up, which at the end, uh, if you, if you want, want to write up the, 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 this initial guy here, so V tau over tau, so now we define V tau, it will be, it will be, so sigma r square p hat squared, and it will be all the sum if one runs right up can be one plus uh, there will be a sum here. I mean, it's, it's very, so this is a u. So I'm I'm, I'm doing a really basic uh, algebra here. So one can write up this sum in the following way. And why is it interesting what we have here? Now we can think about a bit about, uh, about the process. So, okay, what do you see? So, so this variogram divided by the time scale, which we call a signature plot, will have some constant plus the sum behavior. And actually, one can play around. So, so what, okay, what does this mean, first of all? If, uh, if the correlation, so, so these are positive terms here. You're summing positive terms times correlation. So if the correlation is positive, then, um, then you have, uh, then you will have that vari the, the variance increases with time, so it will be constant plus something. If it's negative, then the variance decreases with time scale, so you're, you're, you're summing more and more negative numbers here. Is it clear? Yeah. Why did the C0 vanish from 0 vanish? Because it became 1? Oh, because C0, it's, I mean, if, if the leg is 0, it's the correlation is one. I mean, um, it can have the time. I mean, if it's scale, if it's defined like this, it's, it's a correlation at zero of the same process. It's it's one. In practice, it's actually the, the variance of the of the process. So that's why we normalize by the variance here to have this go to one. So so what we see here is that for positive correlations, this v will be increasing with with tau. With for negative, it will be decreasing. So we have something like this type of behavior. So for example, okay, for a simple world, we can define the, we can say that the correlation is somehow decreasing exponentially. So it's, a, it's some row correlation, so it's a number to the, to the power, uh, power u. We can define a correlation like this. It's an exponentially decreasing uh, correlation. Then one can define, so if the, cor okay, okay, if rho is zero, so if, if correlation, if there is no autocorrelation, of course, this, uh, so this signature plot v tau over tau will be flat, then, because then this is summing zeros and it's a number. Instead, if, 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 the, if the correlation is positive, you will have some increasing behavior 
up to some point, up to the point where the correlation uh, uh, decays to zero with time. If it decays to zero, normally it does. Similarly, I mean, I don't know why, so, sorry, I just pull it, so, so this is one case if there is uncorrelated. If it's positively correlated, you expect something like this. And if it's negatively correlated, you expect some decreasing behavior initially because you're summing negative numbers here. And, uh, and probably it, go, it goes to some, uh, for long times it will flatten out because all correlations uh, die out. Uh, when does, how much time do we have? Okay, 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 okay. Uh, no, no, I mean, I had in mind that it will be much less what I'm discussing, sorry. So I, I have to get used to measuring time properly. Um, so, okay, so this is, uh, this is a way, so, so what do we do here? We, I mean, the, the signature plot and the variogram is one way to look at how the data is correlated, right? If you look at a type of figure like this, if this V tau over tau is decreasing, it gets, we get the idea that it's an, it's an anti it's an reverting process, so, so sequential steps are anti-correlated. Uh, if it's flat, that's the most, most interesting, we, it, it's a normal diffusion. Um, and it's often more interesting. I mean, one could, of course, look at correlations themselves visually. So I just want to say uh, a quick word. So why don't we just look at correlations? I mean, we will, of course, look at correlations, but sometimes in time series, it's, it's good to be careful. I just. Yeah, sorry. So, uh, I should have written what I'm doing, you say. So if it's this, then you say that, so if this guy is decreasing, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a negative correlation. So because what happens is that you have a constant plus something that is summing up neg negative numbers. And then of course this guy would be positive correlations. And in this case, we have exponentially decaying, so they go all to flat, uh, they, they flatten out, but they could, for another correlation, they could be different. So one could look at, uh, look at correlations uh, di I, directly. So, so one could say that instead of signature plots and variograms, why don't you look at correlations? And uh, so, so one can write up, so, so, so one way to define correlations usually, I mean, it's, it's always a question if you are centering the correlation, if you are uh, normalizing it or not. But for example, if you write the correlation in the following manner, so you're, you're, you're centering your correlation, then one can, you know, homework, but it's very trivial, write up that what we had before, this variogram for time, like tau can be written simply up, simply as a two times correlation at zero minus correlation at tau, which is essentially very simply taking the variogram, writing it up, it will, you will get it. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a one to one correspondence. So we could say, okay, why don't we look at correlation? Why, why do we define new, new type of variables? In practice, uh, correlations are often not very useful. They, they, they can be slightly misleading. I just want to give an example without going through it. So, so the problem is when correlations uh, times are very low, very uh, decay very on, sorry, long time scale, so, so, so long range correlations. If, if one wants to write up the, an empirical correlation, so I just want to give this example. If you have an empirical correlation that usually you have your data X, and you define it in the following way. You say C empirical uh, for time for a leg L is the following thing. So something like this, where uh, what I define here, so, so you, you have an initially an X I process, usually, so sorry, okay, so, 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 so this, this X hat is simply defined as, as the original process minus its mean. Uh, 
uh, so, so which is simply x k minus x mean. So, so it's, it's a trivial thing. What you're doing is you, you have a process and you have real data. You take it of the mean normally because that's the way you define the, your correlation here. It's, it's not zero mean in itself. And you calculate uh, the empirical correlation. So what you say, you, you go with windows. Uh, for a window of size L, you will have N minus L points. On all of these, you can sum up what, what this product gives and you normalize it. So it's, it's, it's very simple. The problem is the following, is that, that, uh, that one can show that that exactly, the, the, the following uh, equality exactly holds. So this is, so it's with unfortunate, is it visible? Sorry. Yeah, sure. Yeah, this is the variance. This square is uh, outside. Uh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, is this visible what I wrote here? Okay, so, so what I just say, uh, I'm speeding up, sorry. So that if this is the, your definition of your correlation, one can write up this exact equation. So it's you're summing L from 0 to N, 1 minus L over N. Actually, it's, it's a very, very similar shape as what we had here, not by chance. C empirical leg like L, this sums to zero. One can write up uh, each term here. What happens is that, that well, okay, one can write up uh, uh, very simply the different terms. The problem here is that if you have a process in which the actual real underlying correlation is long range, uh, goes long range and is always positive, then of course you can never have this sum go to zero. So if the real correlation is always positive and, 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 and doesn't come, become zero very fast, so, so okay, in practice, if you have a correlation where, uh, uh, where you have the, 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 the real choral time, the characteristic time of the correlation is L0, where somehow this L0 is, uh, is much larger than one. Of course, it's less than n. Or, I mean, you don't know what happens after that. So if, if the correlation is always positive, this cannot hold. So in practice, your empirical correlation will have to have some spurious negative terms. What, what you will measure is the following. It's a function of L. You measure the correlation. If the true correlation is something like this, for this equality to hold, you will have to measure your empirical correlation will follow this, hopefully. But somehow, it will have some spurious negative terms to, for this sum to go to zero. Be careful when you're looking at actual data. And, uh, well, well, your correlations might not be good, uh, good estimations of the underlying, uh, of what's underlying. Oh, so, so what's the rule normally here? I, I have some more things to say. Uh, should we do it tomorrow and, uh, and should I cut stuff or should I, do, should I finish it? I mean, I don't know what, what's the normal rule. Tomorrow. Huh? Okay. Okay. So, okay, just, just a second. Is there, uh, okay. Um, okay, so let's continue tomorrow. Sorry.